Well, hello again, or for the very first time, ladies and gentlemen, and everybody in between, I am the pixelated incarnation of some guy. And I'm here today to continue the over-analysis of Emerald City Confidential. We're up to part three now. So let's keep on keeping on, folks. So we have spoken to the Scarecrow, who turns out used to be the king of this land. But now he's not. He's like a guy who's just hanging out on our corner reading the newspaper. So either he's homeless, or perhaps he's just a pervert. But who are we to judge? He's royalty. But speaking of royalty, we have to go now and speak to another former royal. And that's the gnome king who is now a bartender. Turns out he knows where Dorothy's fiancé is. You can stop pretending. I know he came here. Whoever do you mean? Ansel. The Scarecrow sent him. He told me himself. Maybe it's the engine that this game runs on, or maybe it was some style choice that Play First insisted on. But one thing that really nags me about this game are all the constant and kind of odd pauses. And making matters all the more worse is how our voice actress is so monotone. So it really seems like we are talking to a robot struggling to compute. So the former Gnome Keen explains that he has this hustle going on where he transforms people into objects that he then uses in his bar. Which sounds a lot more dangerous than you may think. After all, you're in a bar with drunk people and you can break and no one will know if you s- Oh my god, you could assassinate so many people so cleverly. Oops, dropped a beer mug. I need to talk to him. Can you speak, Ornament? No, I can't speak ornament. Would you like to? You know, that's probably the game's best joke. At least for me. So cute and whimsical, and oh, look, we're transforming now. I've got you now, gnome. Oh, no. The general's gonna arrest Ruggedo, thus writing him out of the game. Yeah, we never see or hear anything about the former gnome king after this. I'm not moving from this spot. I never said you had to. I'll talk to you at headquarters. Well, if only my stretches could be so dangerous. So now we gotta figure out a way out of this situation. Perhaps we should start off by talking to Ansel. Ha <laughs> ha! Who was that? Can't you guess? Ansel. Got it in one. So we talked to Ansel for a good long while, and he doesn't spill the beans about anything too important. Well, other than the fact that he and Dorothy aren't about to get married. In fact, they're just in some casual relationship. So yeah, it should be fairly obvious by this point that Dorothy lied about their relationship in order to get us to find him for reasons that, well, he's not about to tell us. But he will tell us about this, which is kind of disturbing if you think about it. Does Ruggedo do this often? Often enough. How do you think he's got such fancy stuff? So everything in here used to be a person? No, not everything, but enough of them. Wow, that's really some I have no mouth and I must scream level of horror there. Now the game does state that if the people want to be transformed back, Ruggedo can do it, but Ruggedo's not here anymore. So these people are trapped as objects now, unable to do or say anything about anyone doing whatever they want to them. And making matters all the more horrific, it's not like the person using the object will even have the slightest bit of awareness that there's a sentient being contained within it. I mean, that's just a really horrific situation. Man, I'm never going to try to break a glass again. So let's get to side of this horrific situation that we are in and talk to a mirror. Because we need to convince her to move in order for us to be able to read the spell that's written on the bar. So it's really fortunate of us that we return to a coat rack right here. Could you tilt down for me? There's a piece of paper on the floor and I need to see what it says. I can't move. I'm a mirror. While it does make complete sense that the mirror an inanimate object is incapable of movement, it turns out she is. But to do this, you have to convince her that she's pretty. And no, you just can't say that she's pretty because apparently that's not enough for her. Instead, what you gotta do here is talk to Ansel and get a bunch of cheesy pickup lines from him. And then tell them to the mirror and she'll move. I know it sounds incredibly bizarre, but just watch it. Your body might be transformed, but your inner beauty can never be changed. That's the sweetest thing anybody has ever said to me. Do you know what would make you even prettier? What? If you tilted down just a little bit. Oh, a great idea. 
Smooth. Trying to convince a mirror that she's pretty is one of the weirdest things I've ever done in an adventure game. Yeah, the more I think about it, it's up there. So now that we're done putting the moves on a mirror, the game introduces us to a new component, and that's magic. You see, we read this magic spell in the bar, and oh my goodness, now we have a magical power, and we can turn ourselves into a coat rack. But yeah, you can only use it in the right place at the right time, so essentially it is an item, but it does have its own special bar. Well, that's wonderful. We're back to being a human, so let's try to do the same on Ansel. Ornamentov. It only works on people who want to be transformed. Ansel is still being stubborn. Yeah, it kind of annoys me that we can't pick up the guy, and we can't pick up the mirror or any other object in this room. After all, they are sentient beings, and we should try to whisk them away to safety now that regado has gone, but, well, whatever. We're outside, and the flying couch is there speaking to us. So clearly, I need to stop judging. D sent me. She wants to see you. Get in. Do I have a choice? Sure. You can ride, or I carry you by the scruff of your shirt. Looks like I'm getting in. Well, we accomplished something and yet nothing at the same time, and how the hell did Dee know we were here? Probably through some magic. Magic explains all the plot holes. But hey, let's be the one now to spill the beans and tell Dee what's up. Ansel is hiding in Ruggedo's bar. He willingly transformed into an ornament to avoid detection. He did, huh? Yeah, that sounds like him. Ansel was on an expedition for the university. Apparently, he found something. I don't know what. Whatever he found, it caused him to go into hiding. Well, thank you, Heroine, for neatly summing up the plot so far. Yeah, we did get sidetracked for a while with this whole boat thing. I'm afraid there was another woman. I knew it. It was that Bobbins woman, wasn't it? Yes. He went to her place right after entering the city. It figures. He goes back to her like a pig to its trough. So, okay, he's done this in the past, and oh my god, I cannot think with those flapping couch wings in the background. Yeah. You know, I do wonder if Dave Gilbert was paid for the word when he was writing this game, because the characters in this game just go on and on and on, and most of it has little to do about nothing. They just keep talking and pausing and talking. It's really tiring after a while. But anyway, our heroine regurgitates the game's plot up to now, to Dorothy, and then eventually something new happens. You find a way to transform him back, and get me that artifact. Alright, now I may have said it before, but I'm gonna say it again. Dorothy looks like she has a broken neck. What is up with this character design? Just this one thing. Name your price. I'm leaving. Your brother! Oh, damn it, Dorothy, you figured out our heroine's only weakness. No, no, no. That word has a hypnotizing effect upon Petra, because now that Dorothy said it, she's going to do whatever she says, because, brother. Does this fake princess really think she can use it to control me? How can I break the spell? Ruggedo's spell can be broken by a transformation potion. Where can I get one? You're the one with the underground contacts, Petra. Find that potion, and get me that artifact. And I'll help you find your brother, blah, 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 blah. Oh my god, Petra can just be led to do anything by anyone telling her, yeah, maybe I'll help you find your brother. After you do this terribly, horribly illegal thing that I will be able to wash my hands cleanly of, it's not like I'm setting you up, Petra. Brother. <sighs> Okay, I had to get that off my chest. So now we go to Scraps, who has a magical item that we need to free Ansel. Which makes sense, you see, because Scraps in and of herself is a magical being. So of course she has access to illegal magical artifacts, because she kind of is one. Yeah, strange legal loophole, but whatever. We now have the potion, and we're going to give it to Ansel against his will. Hey! Now why'd you go and do a thing like that, huh? Ansel, you've got something you're not supposed to have. What are you talking about? The spirit rod. Give it to me. Not a chance, sister. I risk my life getting a hold of this little thing, and I'm not going to give it up without a fight. Oh no, Ansel, don't walk away, you suave son of a- Why don't we just beat him up, break his kneecaps, and tell him that we will kill him? Just walk away, lady. I'm like the wind. You'll never catch me. Yeah, I don't like Ansel at all. I want Petra to go all berserk on him. 
But she won't do that, because this is a civil kind of adventure game. Ansel! Huh? Why is nothing easy in this town? Well, it sounds like it's time for a high-speed couch chase. I have the rod, and you don't. I could sell it to you for, say, 50,000 emeralds. Do you want to die? 40,000? How about I, I just kill you and find it myself? You know, I am genuinely shocked that the word kill is used right there. I say that because this game feels a lot like a Saturday morning cartoon. And you know, in Saturday morning cartoons, they could never use the word kill. Instead, they had to use the word destroy. Oh, it's you. Thank you for finding Ansel for me. But that spirit rod belongs to us. Us? Who is us? The Phanphasms. Phanphasms? Oh, this just gets better and better. Whoa, the dude who we met earlier on in the game who we thought was a minor character was secretly a spy this whole time for some enemies that tried to attack Oz. You know, the Phantasm, half human, half whatever people. They're bad news. We're screwed. Yeah, way to miss the obvious, schoolboy. Catch! Well, okay, everything worked out. We got the spirit rod now. It turns out he had it up his... Oh, dear me, I hope we have gloves. The eastern section is secure, Ginger. Good. And that's your entire report? Affirmative. Very well. In that case... Wait, what's that up there? Yeah, so how do you think this joke's gonna work out? That is Petra, I believe. And she is holding a magic rod. Is she now? I'm surprised her spine didn't break there, but hey, magic. Unable to resist, I was dragged to the royal palace. Practicing magic within the Emerald City? She was caught red-handed, your majesty. Well, let's first regurgitate the game's plot yet again. Yeah, that's what happens here. Petra explains what she's done up till now. We were just there, Petra. You don't need to repeat yourself. And of course, the queen objects because, you know, we kind of broke a bunch of laws. If she desires a lawyer, I will summon one. Petra, so good to see you. Oh no, I totally forgot that the lion was the original villain of this game. That was so brief and so early. Oh no, he's here to defend us, so... Well, I guess the lion's not that bad at all. We're just kind of a jerk. And it goes from bad to worse. Your illegally gained magical knowledge must be removed. It is a requirement that you take this Obliviate pill. And we do, and we go to jail, and oh my god, game, stop dragging stuff out. No questions, just leave. Goodbye. I've got to admit, Junior, what this place lacks in subtlety, it makes up for in style. Unlike your stride, are you a hostage or are you about to break out and dance? Do you ever shut up? Never found the need to. I feel you, brother. I feel you. Agent Cutter, back from the field. I bring a prisoner for the first and foremost. Cutter! Welcome back. It's good to be home, your highness. I trust your mission was successful? Yes and no. Lock this Ozian up and I'll explain. Petra. What? You have a visitor. Step away from the door. Oh, it's you. Hey, Petra, cool your jets. Don't get so mad about the mad who's about to get all introspective upon you. It makes no difference now, does it? I was caught. I'm gonna rot in here for a long time. Often our actions don't matter as much as the reasons behind them. And I think you had a very good reason. A boy of five, gone without a trace. How sad for him, and for you. What is this? Memory Lane? I know what happened, and I'd do it again. So, your brother was five years old when he disappeared, and you fought in the war, so... You had to have been at least eight... So there's like a decade difference between you and your brother. Like, how close were you exactly? Others lost their family too, Detective. Do you think your loss is greater than theirs? Whoa, Petra, deal with that truth bomb. People died in that war, but the deaths were listed. 
Their families knew what happened. It's not much of a comfort, but it's something. William was just... gone. No body, no nothing. I even tried using magic to find him just before the ban went into effect. It all led to nothing. He wasn't dead, he wasn't alive, he didn't exist. So you went to look for him. What choice did I have? He was my brother. You know, not to talk too much about myself, but I have brothers. I have a few of them. I can afford to lose one. But then again, I don't think everyone has the same mentality. So on that note, ladies and gentlemen, and everybody in between, so ends part three of my over-analysis of Emerald City Confidential. I hope you enjoyed this one. And hopefully, I will also see you in the next episode. Bye-bye.